And it's a delight to announce that uh, Raghu, CEO of uh, Retail Prestige uh, Retail Group, is 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 with us uh, as well. Pretty interesting times. Uh, the way uh, the market has shaped from the last uh, IRF that we had. Uh, uh, clearly, there has been a lot that has happened, both negative and positive. Uh, you know, clearly in the last uh, few weeks, the announcement on FDI and multi-brand retail uh, being allowed has energized. And uh, during the course of this day, uh, there has been a number of discussions on how the multi-brand retail is going to impact uh, the retail fraternity. And uh, clearly what we are going to discuss is how this is going to impact the real estate uh, fraternity as well. So I'm going to start uh, straight with uh, Vinay, uh, going in. Vinay, Mr. Vinay Nathkarni, uh, going detail to you. Given that uh, the FDI uh, in multi-brand is uh, going to be allowed, what do you feel is the scenario with, within the retail fraternity? And you know, how does the Indian retail fraternity view this announcement by the government? See, frankly, I think FDI and multi-brand retail, we have been hearing for so long that uh, the excitement that was there maybe four years back, five years back when we started talking about it, uh, it always kept going up and down. And end of the day, today if I see, yes, it's a very good opportunity where uh, the most important part would be, of course, uh, getting uh, access to foreign funds. That would be a big uh, for Indian retailers. And uh, as far as setting up uh, franchise stores or setting up any uh, international brands in India, I think that would be an opportunity for them. But when I look at it from a retailer's point of view from India, yes, it's an access to international funds that would be a big big plus point here. And it's a big tick from the Indian retail for I assume, getting uh, FDI in multi-brand retail. Yeah. Uh, Raghu, uh, likewise, a question to you is, uh, how would this change the Indian retail real estate scenario? Um, I think uh, for a long time we've been saying we don't have a variety of brands that are profitable to fill malls. So I, you know, for me, and from a mall perspective, the best thing which has happened is actually uh, this freeing up of single brand retail. Because I think we'll see so many more brands coming to fill up so many vacant spaces in malls. The multi-brand, the big boys are here already. Whether it's the Hypers that Vinay is doing or Walmart or Carrefour, any of these fellows, they're already here, they'll come. And the big numbers will come from them. But if you want hundreds of brands, Hopefully, we'll see that happening in the next few years. Sunilji, uh, you know, this uh, FDI comes with a number of caveats. Um, and one of the caveats is that it's up to the states uh, to determine whether they will allow FDI to come in within that state. How does this really work? Sort of, I struggle in my mind to understand, you know, what is, how, how the logistics are going to work, how is the structure of the deal going to work, um, and you know, clearly the guys who are uh, on the real estate side who are in non-Congress governed states means that they would have lost the opportunity. I don't think uh, over a period of time, it takes time for people in this country to absorb. Okay? Once they absorb, they'll see the benefits. And over a period of time, I think the real estate as well as the retailers have to work, make the governments understand the benefits of FDI, how will it help the back end, and once that happens, it will open up. It will take its own time. Shrikant, uh, you're, you're the new boy uh, amongst the big boys who've come in onto the retail real estate. Uh, you know, Shrikant obviously represents the LNT Reality Group. He is the India head uh, for, for that group. And they've done a, delivered a very large uh, retail mall successfully in Chandigarh. Uh, so two questions. What prompted you to get into this sector, one? And second is, is the intent to continue to grow within this sector? Well, what prompted us to go, I can't answer. It happened four years back. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that uh, at LNT, we built a fantastic mall. Uh, all the things which a shopkeeper wants, we have tried to put it there. We believe with this FDI opening, we'll have much quality retail coming in. They will have their learnings, and the Indian retail quality will also go up. So we are looking forward to a very good time, which the consumers will have, which the retailers will have, hopefully we will have. We are doing another big mall uh, here in Bombay as well. So as of now, we are there. Uh, we will continue to be there. Thanks. And then Shrikanta, I asked this question to many developers, uh, but given uh, that you're, you're, you know, you're here, I want to ask you this question as well. Given an opportunity uh, for you to do retail, residential, and offices, <laughs> uh, you know, what is, what is the uh, sector that you would choose? That's not a fair question. <laughs> uh, 
But having said that, as a developer, it has to be a proper mix. We cannot do all of one type. And even in a very good residential, which people think is nice and profitable, you need a real retail piece for the people to stay in. So retail has its own uh, space in all of this. And as a developer, we need to look at having a proper mix rather than one or the other. Really, Shilpa, from uh, your side, uh, you know, you've seen the evolution of malls uh, over the last few years. Um, and you know, clearly in the uh, sort of mid-90s, we saw malls of about 200,000 square feet emerge. Then in the early 2000s, you know, we've seen that go up to 300 or 350,000. Uh, and now we're seeing malls that are being built between half a million to say 700,000 square feet. So two questions. Uh, uh, one, do you think that going forward four years from now, you know, malls will go up to a million square feet from where we are? And second is, what has been the evolution and the experience as we have graduated and in increasing the square footage of these malls? Anuj, I'd just like to also add to one of your previous questions on states, which uh, Sunilji had said, just to add to it, I think water finds its own level eventually. So it, while it is already very clear about pro-FDI and anti-FDI states, it's statistically demonstrated that by doing FDI, you will increase employment and the overall GDP of the state. So it, it's, it's likely and it's eventually going to be that all states will come around and gradually become pro-FDI. So that I just wanted to add to that. Secondly, on your question of uh, scale of projects, I'm actually getting a feeling of deja vu on this. Because if you rewind to IRF uh, 2005, two years prior, two and a half years prior to the Lehman days, um, we were talking about shopping centers going from 300 to 400, and suddenly everybody wanted to talk about a million square feet. I think suddenly post Lehman, in the post Lehman world, there were, uh, I know of projects that converted the top two floors to offices. Some of them were, they, they you know, stopped building half of it. Some of them just uh, converted the entire project into something else. Some of them were left built and empty. So, or built, occupied by retailers, but no consumers. So I think that irrespective of market cycles, today we are more upbeat because of FDI or let's say stabilizing of uh, the economy or the reforms. But the answer for scale is not completely aligned to this one point alone. It's really also dependent on what cities, whether we are talking about B-grade cities, A-grade cities, what distances are people willing to travel, what real estate costs are permitting what uh, you know, scales of projects. Because there is something called productivity in the business. So if I look at a smaller city like a, you know, a Siliguri, or, or you know, some, something even more um, you know, uh, conservative in scale size, then I don't think that a million square feet will just fly simply over there. So it really depends on which city we are talking about, what is the positioning of the project, and so on and so forth. Vishal, uh, you've done a sort of mixed-use development, and it's amongst the most successful that we've seen, where you've got healthcare, uh, retail, hospitality, office, residential, education in one big unit. If you were to do just the retail, how does the math for that work out? Would it be sustainable, just pure retail box that you were to deliver and inherit the cost of the land? Okay, uh, I'm assuming that you're referring to the same location. Yes. Um, if I have to do this, only the mall in the same location, I think it would be almost as uh, viable a proposition as it were uh, with a mix, in the, within a mixed-use development purely because uh, I think the uh, city of Bangalore has uh, been decentralizing since the last 10 years or so very well. So it moves toward, it moved towards the south, moved to the west, and then it's going towards north. So we are more on the northwest side, and uh, we are actually moving, uh, decentralizing very well as a city. Having said that, um, you know, uh, Bangalore is also a very homogeneous, uh, you know, city as far as the population uh, mix is concerned. Uh, therefore, it becomes easier for a market here to reach out to its uh, target uh, groups. Um, Bringing a mall of this nature uh, in a location of this type uh, is certainly uh, one that is, uh, it's, it's a, it provides a good, uh, you can say, uh, probability of success uh, because A, uh, it is the, the, the city is moving in that direction and B, the development itself that we have created. If you have to look at the mall in isolation, the design, 
uh, you've seen the mall, so you've seen the design and uh, the effort that we put in creating the mall uh, of 800,000 square feet. It's been quite, uh, you know, appreciated, quite well appreciated, and it's a, it's a magnet on its own. So I think it would have been, uh, it would, uh, as a standalone proposition also would have been quite uh, welcoming. Yeah. And uh, Raghu, if I was just to continue with that question with you, uh, would, and you know, you're doing a number of malls, you're doing half a dozen malls that are going to come up over the next 24 months. Uh, is the math for those stacking up? I think so. Um, we haven't gone overboard in terms of size. Uh, ex with one small exception, in the smaller cities, we are around the 300,000 square feet mark, which we think is about the right figure. Okay. Only in one case did we build a slightly larger mall because the land dictated that and we couldn't put it to other use. Um, in the larger cities, we've been gradually ramping up. But, you know, I think six, 700,000 seems to be a sweet spot. And I think anything more than that we can do, I'm not sure we'll do it profitably. Okay, so I think let's do it sensibly. I think scale will come over time. Uh, maybe a million square feet at three, four, five years away. I'm not sure. At least from our perspective, I don't think we'll do that today, for sure. Monish, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, most of the developers uh, struggle is really after having completed the mall, what is the exit for them? Uh, you know, clearly many of them come in from the residential background and, you know, you construct residential and you're able to sell. Uh, you do offices and you're able to find investors, both institutional and retail investors who buy offices. Uh, clearly in retail malls, we're sort of struggling to find that once you've completed the mall and that it is operational, what is the exit? Are there enough institutional buyers or you really need to go out and do a strata title sale uh, to exit the mall? Uh, I think first of all, good that some malls did bad because the speciality will now come back. You know, all of us want to do everything. I remember when we did Ansel Plaza long years back and when uh, Unitech then announced a million square feet, all of us said, oh, they're crazy. And today we're adding another 800,000 to that. So the one, one part of the whole thing is that only do the job if you know it well, otherwise don't do it. Uh, you know, we want to do the leasing ourselves. We say mall management is also what we know. We also want to do the facilities ourselves. Half of the people don't even know the difference. So A, if you want to be in this business, you have to work with the specialist. There's a special, special guy who can do the retail, the people sitting on the table, the special people who can help them get onto the board, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, this whole thing of a strata sale or a sale or a read, I'm doing nine malls, I'm selling all of them. I've got two malls, three malls operational. Uh, one of them I solely own, which is Rohini, and it's not doing great. And there's another one, Great India Place, all of us know, is rocking. So uh, this whole logic of it's a sold mall situation or a lease mall situation, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't vary me because I have been the the mall which we sold is the most rocking mall. So and 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 we're doing nine malls, we're selling them, and I think we have no problems in uh, getting those investors. That's a very interesting point, uh, Manish, and I fully appreciate where you're coming in from. I, I just want to turn this uh, question to Vinay uh, because you know he's uh, running one of the largest uh, supermarkets uh, in India. Um, you know, whenever we heard uh, Munish say that, uh, and, you know, he's been very straightforward saying is, look, we need to exit. We're not finding institutional buyers. There are hardly any large high net worth individuals who can buy the full mall. Uh, so whilst, you know, we're going to manage it and make sure that the experience of the customer remains the same, but ultimately we need to start a title and sell it. And that's the only way the developer will be able to get back uh, the money. You know, you are a large occupier in these malls. Uh, what would you say to that statement? No, I think, I mean, what I'd say is that, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, a developer who has decided that, you know, in that development, that the model necessitates that there has to be sale, then so be it. I mean, it has to be sale. I mean, I would, if I had a wish list, I would say that, you know, ideally, it should be an own model. Because, I mean, our experience shows that, you know, wherever we've been in own models, uh, generally, the malls are better run, the occupancies are much higher, the tenant mixes are better. So, I mean, you have, you know, all those considerations for which I would say that, you know, ideally it should be an own mall. But, however, I mean, practically, you know, life is not so simple. So, there are times when, you know, you need to sell and, you know, that's the model of the developer. 
and the only thing I would say is that, you know, in those situations, what is important is that, I mean, again, the wish list would be, and for us, an important consideration when we do negotiate malls of that type is to try and ensure that, you know, all the, the, the sold portions, that still there is a control which is being retained by the, the developer in terms of leasing, in terms of the mall management. So at least, you know, that control should remain so that it doesn't get completely out of hand. It doesn't become, you know, a, a, a mall where, you know, you've got a whole lot of investors who are coming and trading in properties. And the result is that, you know, I mean, a large proportion of the mall is unoccupied. And, you know, which results obviously within a very short period in the mall becoming a failure. But, you know, I must appreciate uh, both Monish and Vinay because I can tell you about a year ago, if we were to have this discussion, uh, you know, clearly both the parties would have taken position. I think in the last 12 months, so much has uh, flown, uh, you know, below the bridge that each one appreciates the other partner. And, you know, very truly what you said is, Vinay is correct, you know, at the end of the day, oh, we want retail real estate. Now, if there is no institutional private equity or funding from the financial institutions is not available, you know, the best that we can say is to Monish is make sure that you are managing the mall. Whatever you need to do behind to make sure, you know, you are financially comfortable, go ahead and do that. May not be the ideal model, but, you know, that's the only way that we'll have to reconcile. John, I... Sorry, uh, just to add a point, you know, I'm, I'm not saying, you know, the problem is why should we run our malls? Even if I sold it to a REIT, it would have been run from a JLL or, or, a, or, or some other company. I mean, I'm saying get the specialist onto the job. Not that I cannot do leasing. I cannot create a leasing team. But why should I do it? That's not my job. My job is to construct the mall and I'm good at doing that. We are just getting into somebody else's territory is what I feel. If you are able to, whatever model we follow, and by the way, you, all of us know, GIP occupancy rate is luckily quite hard. So, so that, that's an advantage, sorry. So, yep, go ahead, Shilpa. I was just going to turn it to John and uh, you know, ask him what happens in the more international markets. Just, uh, just to add to the sale, sale point, I think there are also some very innovative financial structuring that is available today where um, in absence of getting financial in, uh, institutional investors and equally not wanting to do a strata title sale, you know, at an SPV level, smaller HNIs can own percentages of the SPV, which is correlating to the, uh, as a prorata share of what they would have owned as a store. What, what that leads to is that you're able to get funding from smaller group of investors, and yet they are, uh, the, you know, you're able to retain control at an entity level because you have not sold real estate, but uh, ownership in the entity. John, if I was to come to you on this point, uh, you know, cl sorry, clearly from the international perspective, uh, you know, want to want to understand that is this uh, an acceptable model that uh, you are able to do strata title sale? In this case, uh, we try as much as possible to have uh, some specific clause in our contract where we will be able to have a preemptive right on assets and uh, real estate. Sunil, are you, are you finding going forward uh, there are going to be lesser malls and uh, you know, retail real estate is going to be a challenge? But I believe, I think, uh, as you said, in the last 12 months, the retailer and the developer have started understanding and have got a better relationship. I think uh, people have matured. People who understand what retail is from the real estate point of view will be in the business. People who have created a model like Unitech has, where they have sold the property off, but they still control, and the mall is successful. But a lot of other people who have not been able to do that. Now, if some, people should actually work on, to, on the, the right formula which has worked, develop it. I personally believe that the most profitable business in real estate, in a long-term perspective, is retail. Is retail. Now, there are mall which was made nine years back, he leased it for 75 rupees. Today he is leasing the same property for 500 rupees. And after five years, he will again going to lease it at 700 rupees. What will give you on a long term basis a consistent return like this? Nothing. Now you sell it. It's all the way the, I think with FDI coming up. I hope uh, more money would be coming to the real estate to get cheaper funds to make better malls. Uh, but I believe that when you create a mall, it's very important for the size. <clears throat> uh, 
what you get inside is a mix of of a lot of things which we have learned over a period of time and that has to be actually used in a proper manner to develop more successful malls but uh, today also i would believe uh, in india there are 24 malls only okay rest are all shopping centers right so there are a lot of malls which are going to come up but over a period of time uh, and there would be some shortfall but that's okay it's part of life so I, I just want to turn it out, uh, Vinay, to you, uh, and then I'll come to Raghu. You know, one of the things that we used to discuss, uh, you know, two or three years ago, were really rents, uh, that the developer understanding on rents is not there, CAM, um, and mall management. Do you think we've moved ahead over the last two, three years, and you're getting sort of different understanding on these three points when a developer comes to you and offers his property for your brand? Actually, I know it's, it is, uh, I mean, you can see this panel and you can understand. Till the past few uh, uh, IRFs, we always had a mall developer versus retailer kind of a uh, debate. But now here we are sitting all on the same side and trying to work out a solution to what is happening. So I think it, it kind of speaks for itself that over the last few years, as uh, they rightly said, we have matured. We, we understand each other's problems. Retail is a tough business. India is a tough market, so therefore, you know, uh, it's going to be that much more difficult for all of us to, uh, unless we understand each other's problems and work well. And yes, there are uh, good solutions that have come about over a period of time on uh, rent and CAM and uh, so on and so forth. But what is most important is the, the understanding between the developer and the retailer has, over these uh, couple of uh, recessionary years, if I may say so, has really helped the growth of uh, uh, retail in India. Otherwise, the kind of stance that we used to see earlier was sure shot suicidal for retailers. But now I can see a lot of accommodation going on which helps the retailers to tide over certain problems and then, you know, live for the next day. So something good has come out of the bad times. Yes. Um, and, you know, Raghu, if I was to ask you that question, uh, have the developers uh, been able to appreciate the challenges uh, that the retailers go through, and have the retailers have understood the challenges that the developers go through? Um, is it better today? Yeah, I think it's much better today. But uh, just for a minute, Anuj, allow me to go back to the previous one when Sunil was talking. Um, I think short to medium term, let's say up to four, five years, I think you're going to see a serious shortage of space, of quality malls. There are going to be plenty of malls. But especially now, FDI has opened up in the next two or three years, you should expect better quality brands to come. I think space, unfortunately, I think rentals will go up. Okay. Rentals will go will, up. I, I believe only because if you're scrambling for space in a limited uh, scenario, I believe rentals will go up. Hopefully, it will even out beyond five years when the supply increases. Uh, because uh, what's worrying me is I'm beginning to see a bit of the 2006-07 frenzy. People are chasing us for space again across various properties. And sometimes it's becoming irrational. So uh, it's a bit of a worry. Um, we have a slightly different view, uh, which we started with Forum in 2004, when we introduced revenue share. So we're much more relaxed about that concept today. As far as CAM is concerned, I, I, we've never faced a problem. Um, just to give you an idea, our CAM in uh, Forum, which opened nine years ago, is the same as it was two years back. Very marginal change. So we've actually, what we've done is, we've tried to see where we can cut down. We've actually eliminated uh, headcount, and we've rationalized our costs. It's a struggle, but we still keep on it. So I think when we do that, then I think retailers appreciate that. And then there is uh, nobody second guessing, is this guy making money on cab? I think those issues have gone away. And, and, and do you think that the retailers understand the challenges that the developers face? I think to a very large extent, I would say, compared to two, three years back, definitely. Uh, I think both sides are much more open and transparent. You know, end of the day, uh, you can't fudge rental numbers, cam numbers, any other numbers. You can't fudge revenue numbers. Pretty much, you know, it's open. Uh, I think we have a good feel what retailers are doing. Just to give everybody an idea, uh, we started something in Forum uh, when two months back, extending it to all our malls, where we're wiring up the bulk of the retailers on our POS. So I'm getting daily sales data from everybody. Now, two years back, impossible <laughs> to even go and suggest that I will get information. We have confidentiality clauses. It's only a daily dump. 
but I'm still getting information daily. I couldn't have dreamt of this some time back. Sunil ji, I saw Shrikant, you know, smiling and saying, oh, that's great, rentals are going to go up now. Do you think uh, that, is going to be, that is going to be true? Shrikant, you can... I, I would like to first answer on the previous one, uh, on the CAM and uh, rentals. I, 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 I think, think you may need to hold the mic a little I, bit uh, higher. I think the retailers are also understanding. Uh, when uh, we have these discussions, they also want a win-win solution. And it's not only a number. Of course, it helps uh, with LND to say that we CAM is going to be transparent. A lot of transparency has come into showing that, which is fine. I think the rental models have also changed from fixed rental to minimum guarantees plus revenue share X, Y, Z. Uh, and as Sunil also said, that the quality bonds are less. So part of this chasing will happen to quality malls and quality spaces, uh, like Forum, what they are running. And of course, these are innovations to get uh, daily sales, which will be a great thing to going forward to. What happens to the rentals? Uh, the quality malls, the rentals will go up. On the non-quality malls, maybe they will go down. So that's what you can see. You we should sign everything tonight before you leave. We, we signed LNT Mall. Okay. I did not sign it earlier because they were very clear. They wanted, when we started building the mall one, four years back, they wanted a 100,000 square foot hypermarket. And that time I told, nobody can do and make money with a 100,000 square foot store. Finally, when they agreed to do a 45,000 square foot store, we signed with them. The mall is making, going to make a little bit money. Hopefully, we will also make a little money. We as future group, we are not signing, and I believe all malls which understand the requirement of a retailer is getting signed and getting filled. The, and fit outs are happening there. Malls which are not understanding the requirement of the retailer are not getting filled up. If they are filled up also, it's on paper. Getting fit out started there is, is not happening. This is very important. Yes, rents would go up. But I believe most of the retailers have understood that if they are not going to make money, in a couple of years' time, out of that store, they are, I believe they're not going to sign. Because if they sign it, they will have to close after two years, and that will be bigger problems. So rentals is a, but I, I, I believe uh, the, the, with the malls coming in the right sizes and the right uh, areas and locations, rentals should not be an issue. But there are other issues in this country which uh, uh, a real estate guy does not actually understand, but we have been trying to speak to them. You look, there are other issues by running out of a city of Mumbai or uh, Pune. There are other costs which are not there in Delhi, or which are not there in Bangalore or Hyderabad. But these are costs which puts us down by 3% on our margins. We wow. cannot afford to do run the stores in the city. So it's a, it's a whole uh, shift, and I think uh, people will, over a period of time, start accepting. Uh, but everybody is happy, there's FDI coming in, new retailers will come, they will not know, and they will sign up a property at 125, 150 rupees for a hypermarket. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> We're just coming on to that point only, which uh, Sunilji ended. Do you think there's going to be a frenzy of uh, signing spaces by the retailers? You know, one, uh, those who would want inward investment to come in, and hence, you know, size counts, so you would want to have a a uh, lot many more stores, uh, and hence the valuation goes up. And second is to try and sign up everything so that they are able to block the foreign retailers to come in. See, first of all, I don't know how much of, uh, uh, because single brand uh, retailing 100% has been open for quite some time, and uh, we see you know, a trickle coming in, not, not in big numbers. If the same scenario was in 2002, 2003, maybe the people would have rushed in. Because now with a hindsight, when they have seen others making money, losing money, and so on and so forth, they have a better hang of what this market is and how big that market is. Whatever the, uh, uh, what do you say, consultants would uh, paint a rosy picture. When you come, come to the market and actually see how it is happening, then you would realize that it is not a very easy market to really make money in. So if I'm making good money in my hometown or my uh, home country, it's OK to put in to say that, OK, I'll lose money for the next 10 years in India. But when I'm not making money in my home country because of recession, I don't know how many people would be wanting to again lose money in this country as well. So therefore, I think there would be some time where uh, uh, it will take for the FDI thing to really catch up and people to be interested in uh, India. 
uh, the other part is of course the restrictions that the government has imposed in terms of 50% uh, in uh, uh, infrastructure etc which will again have its own impact of people wanting to come in so there are lots of uh, doubts how many people will really get into india in multi brand retail as well but be it as it may what i would really be worried about is uh, if the malls actually look at higher rentals we have seen that happening in the past they start with higher rentals end of the day after 3 years when the renegotiations happen and if people if people are not going to make money they are not going to make money and they are not going to lose money for the sake of being in the mall so i suppose this it will ultimately get uh, even out the mall owners also know and the uh, retailers also know ultimately both of them have to make money so which which is the what i call the uh, the sweet spot is what they will ultimately strike and uh, settle so i i mean opening malls with uh, higher rentals is good eventually you know the uh, like she said the water settles at its own level and the right uh, uh, mall mix will happen and the right uh, rental structure will get set in very interesting uh, when it just uh, on on that point and you know this is a point, this is a question that is being asked by a number of uh, overseas retailers who are entering in here uh, into india this thing is uh, is the cost of occupancy of doing business uh, in india are uh, higher lower equal to more mature markets you said the cost of so cost of occupancy that means you know cost of rental cam all the, all the charges added on is it as a percentage of revenue um you know if so so your brand for example on a on a hypermarket or uh, on the apparel side would you say the cost of occupancy in dubai would be as a percentage of the revenue same Uh, lower or higher than your operations in india no i think i mean there is no there's no doubt that our occupancy costs here in india are definitely higher as a percentage of turnover uh, as a percentage of turnover so if i were to i mean if i were to talk about uh, you know our hypermarket business and if i were to compare uh, rentals i mean not just we don't have hypermarkets out of india but if i were to compare rentals of you know a hypermarket operation in india versus a hypermarket in southeast asia or in europe or in uh, in russia or in uh, the us uh, we are i mean considerably higher on occupancy cost it's not just you know i mean it's not just small uh, factor it it's a wow. it's a, it's a big wow. difference and we are hearing cost. that the rents will continue to go up which means yeah see i think you know as far as rents are concerned you know just a, sorry just a reaction to you know some of the discussion which happened on rents see i agree i think with you know what the general comment is that see at the end of the day you know you will pay how much you can afford to pay yeah. you see and uh, even if you know there is an eagerness to get into a particular site or to be in a particular place and for whatever the consideration is you might be willing to you know extend that gestation period by a little bit of time but it's a little bit of time so i think you know the key thing here is that you know between the developer and the retailer uh, concerned uh, there necessarily needs to be some sort of an understanding on this and that understanding really stems from and i must say that over the last 2 3 years this understanding has really you know altered and developed and you know become far more positive than what i remember maybe 4 5 years ago good point and and here it's all linked to i think today i mean say within our sort of format which is a hypermarkets uh there is this revenue share aspect of you know the commercial which has now become a very important part and uh so i think a lot has happened and you know a revenue share is at the end of the day you know you share the upsides you share the downsides so you know i mean that principle is good but having said that there is still you know i think we still have a lot more work to do in that area because i think you know that has been understood that has been taken on board that's been implemented but the issue which still remains in my view is really the understanding of this revenue share because what typically happens is that you know in certain formats like say you know our format which is a hypermarket i mean at the end of the day in one mall you will have one store you will have one hypermarket so when you know from a developer perspective they'll have lots of options because you know there are many hypermarket players so uh, you know you typically would get into a negotiation on that side so i think you know what and when you get into a negotiation when you start negotiating something like a revenue share it becomes very dangerous 
because you know you really need to understand what that revenue share stands for because within a concept also there are differences i mean within a hypermarket there are some hypermarket operators who have more of one category and less of some other category and so you know it really depends on what is the mix that you want for the mall so for your mall do you want more of you know a non food do you want a food do you want something more of a particular category of food do you want fresh foods so what is it that you really want and there is an implication of that on revenue share so you know these are i think nuances which need to be understood and uh, because uh, you know if you finally sort of give it to the highest bidder you know you might end up in a situation where it might not be the best thing for your mall so i think i think really an underst a better understanding of that and you know there are while i'm speaking you know there are people sitting you know on this in the same row who you know who understand this perfectly but i would say the larger part still of you know the developer fraternity have not really understood the nuances of this so i think you know that's one area where there is still a lot more learning you have a minimum guarantee rental which normally goes with the revenue share how do you decide on that so i think you know the the understanding of that again i mean necessarily has to be that you know when you have a revenue share what is an mg an mg should be like a safety net how do you define a safety net it's got to be a function of your revenue share you peg it at a certain level which is you know what you consider to be the potential of the site and then maybe a 90 or 80% of that would be your minimum guarantee so these are factors which you yeah. know still yeah. need i think yeah. more discussion and more understanding but we've come a long way yeah. shilpa just uh, turning that point uh, on to you um, you know you've been in practice many years and you've seen the evolution of malls come through uh, do do you believe that the appreciation of design within the developer community has improved uh, over the last 5 or 6 years certainly i think uh, the concept understanding that retail planning and design is one of the key drivers of the success of this business it has it has definitely seeped a lot more into the developer community now versus 5 uh, 7 years ago and um, having said that there are still a lot of um, uh, you know design is a very uh, nebulous and a gray area because um, very often there is still a tendency for many a developers to get swayed by fanciness associated with the design and uh, design has two components to it one is core fundamentals of retail planning which is what determines your basics circulation visibilities access egress which is actually a fundamental given every shopping center across the world which is even an average performer needs to have this core fundamental in place now the second component is aesthetics aesthetics i feel is still an area which could differ it could be subjective it could be uh, even let me even go ahead and say compromised to an extent but retail planning cannot be compromised and uh, in fact world over it's a specialized field and uh, i think that acceptability in india has definitely increased over the last 3 years um but i think there is uh, as an industry there is still a lot more to be desired and uh, we we need to uh, separate the two components of design uh, you know the the aesthetics yep. and the yep. core fundamentals last couple of questions before i open the floor uh, for asking the panelist uh, any questions that you you may have um really john from from your side uh, you know you look at the imax uh you know uh Uh, stuff uh, would you would you uh, say that it is a big draw of footfalls within the malls and what has the experience of imax been you know more internationally to be able to attract uh, footfalls as an anchor um yeah worldwide imax has uh, undergone tremendous growth um over the last uh 3 years um we've had incredible success all around the world um our second largest market is china we've got uh, about 250 theaters um that are going to be opening there very shortly and um you know we expect india um to kind of start following that that trend um you know we're bringing more and more um local product um into the imax network um 
So as a result, we've just announced our first uh, Bollywood feature, uh, which is going to be coming out next year. Doom 3 will be an IMAX. And, 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 and what we've discovered is that IMAX theaters um, tend to provide additive business um, for footfalls and, and cinemas around the world. Um, we had to prove that to the Hollywood studios in order to get more and more films into our network. Um, and so what happens when you add an IMAX to a cinema is that you end up um, kind of turbocharging that. It's, 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 it's a way we're finding that people who normally would be at home on their computers or, or doing something else, because at the end of the day, for all the retailers here, there's a lot of competition, not only for dollars, but for retailers' time. Um, and so IMAX is one way to get people out of their homes and back into, into the retail space. Um, so in India, for example, um, we've got a number of theaters uh, opening up over the next uh, little while. For example, in about two weeks' time, we have one opening up in Forum in Bangalore. Um, we're opening up in um, Phoenix Mills in Mumbai. Um, and you know, two more in Chennai coming for before the end of the year. So it's you know, our growth in India has gone from you know fairly stagnant level to uh, quite uh, dramatic turnaround overnight. The malls, which again every I think developer likes, you know, they want um, cinema operators who have active Facebook pages, active social networking platforms, all those sorts of things, which draw people into the retail environment um, and IMAX tends to, to lean towards those sort of cinema operators as our partners. Um, so as a result, um, it's kind of a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah. So last question to uh, Munish and Sunilji, uh, to you. Uh, Mun Munish, you, you've got malls in tier one and tier two cities, um, and, and you know going down uh, maybe to tier three cities. Uh, what has your experience been in, in really the tier two, tier three? And Sunilji, I want to come back uh, on that question and, and ask, you know, how has your experience on retail uh, been in those tier two, tier three cities? Uh, I, think, I think it's just the same. If you've done your catchment analysis right, uh, you can't go wrong anywhere you do a mall. I mean, you want to do a mall in a village, uh, probably get, uh, I mean, get to do a, do a big bazaar and then and, and, uh, you try and get a, Maybe a, maybe even a pantaloon there might not work, but if you get a big bazaar there. So if your catchment analysis is right, and you know, on, again, coming on the rental thing, that's where I say, what does the specialist do for you? When you call a bank for a fixed deposit, do you ask him the rate? No, it's printed in the, you know, if, if similarly I know a hypermarket is going to pay me, why, do, why does it pay 3% somewhere and 5% somewhere? No. If all that is established by a specialist agency for this area, this can be a, this kind of a revenue share and this kind of a rental, and if that is acceptable to the retailer and the developer, I think, I think the marriage will be even more, uh, you know, more enjoyable in that sense. Uh, uh, talking back about the, uh, the smaller cities, I think they have, they have equally good potential, provided your, your catchment analysis is right. I mean, you can't do, you can't do a, a Zara or an equivalent in, in a tire to a tire. As of now, these people have the aspiration, but you'll have to take the city forward step by step. You can't just get them to a metro level. And Sunilji, your experience in tier two, tier three as a retailer? It's been, it has been a mixed uh, reaction till date. But uh, what we have seen, the tier two, tier three cities in the east have done very well. Uh, tier two, tier three in the west have not done that well. But again, as you said, it has to be the right size. And I believe uh, we have to break our mindset. We have to remove that. Every city, you cannot copy a, uh, a select city mall and take it into Nagpur, OK? Mm -hmm. And you cannot uh, take a, a, a market city into Dhanbad, OK? But people who have done that have, uh, there is one case, I believe there's a mall in Maharashtra somewhere where we have a store. It's still a 600,000 square foot mall in a city which has a population of what, uh, 1.2 million people. The whole city does not have that much retail space and you've gone ahead and created a mall. It's not going to work. So I think uh, from the consumer point of view, people there have evolved. I think today in the morning, uh, someone was talking about, you know, the p person in UP, in Muradabad, is seeing the same uh, Arch Ki Bao, some TV channel, and the sitting, person sitting in Mumbai also seeing the same. The aspirations are there. And it is being converted, but yes, you cannot have a pantaloons or a Zara in some place. But of course, there, what we have seen, uh, cities, uh, tier three cities have accepted pantaloons very nicely, along with the big bazaar, doing phenomenal business. 
from the uh, from the third month the store is profitable so they are maturing yeah they are maturing but it has to be the right size and location is very important in a two or three a two or two, uh, two and two or three cities if you go outside the city you're finished good uh, that's that's been very interesting uh, before i open the floor for questions um, you know i've got a sort of a 3 minute uh, video uh, which is uh, put together by oshan um, and uh, i would i would request you to uh, go through this video and we'll uh, then have a couple of questions from the floor for these uh, panelists so um, i already know that uh, many of you uh, already know what i will uh, present but uh, for us it's uh, uh, very important to be associate as soon as possible for the design of the shopping center <coughs> our goal as ocean uh, is to sustain the investment plans through quality shopping centers welcoming comfortable and uh, sustainable uh, so for this we have a list of uh, 20 uh, I would say fundamentals, okay. But uh, I would like to be shorter today, and just to present uh, some of them, which for us uh, it's very important to pay attention at the very beginning of uh, of the design. I've been developed uh, from our experience. Auchan has his own real estate company who own or manage today around 320 uh, shopping centers uh, within uh, certain countries. So <clears throat> these fundamentals are universal. Uh, they only contain the structure element to be maintained over time to make a value more. So first, the shopping center must be visible and uh, when uh, he is uh, with an hypermarket, both have to be, to be uh, visible. That's been uh, the hypermarket and the shopping center. Um, hypermarket has to have uh, a good signage. Access and uh, car park must be adapted to the various type of locomotion. That's very important for cars, public transportation, taxi, bikes, pedestrian, and so on and so on. So the hypermarket entrance for us uh, has to be, uh, must be visible from the arcade's main access points, doors or moving uh, walkway, to attract as many customers as possible. The customer pass is free of uh, any obstacles, and for compact shopping center, the hypermarket entrance must be visible from the main aisle, close to the entrance and moving walkway. Car access accesses have to be easy and visible. We require a minimum of uh, two entrances for cars, and we need to have separate access and exits, which has to be organized for lorries and uh, deliveries with a dedicated service area for the hypermarket. So then the hypermarket sales area must be for us uh, rectangular or square to ensure that uh, it remains clear for our customer. A good shopping center has also to provide additional premises for the good organization waste deposit area, meter area, and different transformer for the hypermarkets, offices, and so on and so on. So uh, I would observe, but uh, we will come back to, to, to the discussion we had before, that the level of the rent for hypermarket has to allow to be as discount as possible for our customers, giving the possibility for the developers and owners of the gallery to have higher rents if having a performing encore for the hypermarket. And then uh, allowing both of us to be profitable. We have some uh, experience in uh, Russia uh, where we have some share revenue as uh, rent. And uh, many of them used to come to, to, to us. And they know that having our hypermarket in their gallery they can 
increase the rent of the gallery by 30% more. Thank you very much, Mr. Terry Martin. Uh, that's very, very enlightening. And uh, thank you for coming, coming here in India and joining us on this uh, panel. Uh, with this, I'm going to open the floor for any questions uh, that you have. Uh, uh, you know, there are, there are a few mics, uh, and you'll probably need the mic with the rain uh, that's, uh, that's going on. Um, so any, any question for uh, the panelists uh, up here? Uh, very happy to take that. Uh. My name is Ismail. Uh, I have a 25 retail store in the Middle East. Based on my experience, I have to raise some concern about the mall. Recently, we started uh, uh, retail stores in India, particularly in South India. First thing, I just want to raise a concern of the security, safety of uh, you know people and mall. See, in uh, UAE, uh, you know the uh, common area designated for the movement of people. If you see in India, most of the malls, uh, uh, you know, they uh, renting out. Uh, after the completion of the mall, after taking the store, we have seen uh, people, you know, the mall management is uh, renting out this common uh, area which is not supposed to do that. Along with that, uh, you know, there are, uh, uh, in so many malls we have experienced uh, the fire safety matter. Sprinklers are there, but it is not working. Like that, you know, we are not complaints with uh, uh, these type of safety matter. That is the first thing. And second thing, uh, there are so many things which we can standardize it, particularly the loading factor, the built-up area and chargeable area, because it's a very big confusion, you know, that uh, different, different uh, mall management is using uh, different, different, you know, type of uh, calculation, which is, I think, uh, all of you can, you know, uh, standardize it, certain thing. Uh, same thing like that, this cam charge also, uh, some of the mall people, you know, they are not uh, providing, uh, actually, cam charge will be the actual. So they are not providing any details. They are just saying that it is uh, electricity charge is gone up, this is gone up and these malls, you know, that you have to take a standard which will be helping a healthy relationship and all. And one more thing, uh, regarding this revenue sharing part and all, I have an experience in a Bangalore, uh, uh, one of the mall, when I went for an agreement, uh, they said, okay, revenue sharing, I agreed, rent, I agreed, and uh, they wanted a joint account. That also I agreed. Uh, see, finally they said uh, uh, they will appointing the manager also. As a retailer, how can I control uh, uh, my retail business? So this is a very, you know, difficult uh, level of, uh, you know, retailers are facing. So I'm very happy that this uh, FD is allowing and so many international players are coming. So better we have to prepare to complaints with, you know, international standard. So we have to take that level, uh, that directions now itself. Thank you. Raghu, so just very quickly, uh, three points uh, that have been highlighted. Uh, one is uh, that the common area which should be left as open is filled up and rented out. Uh, what's your view on that? No, no. Um, first of all, uh, I think in, um, in most malls, even in some of our malls, we do have a few kiosks in the common areas. But we would never do anything which would impede the flow of traffic or the way customers walk through a mall, or compromise on fire safety. It just adds to the overall element, especially when you have a large atrium to do certain activities and kiosks. I think it's welcome because it's a good relief for customers. But uh, uh, we, we would never do anything which would build or impede anyone, whether it's a retailer or customer. I don't think any good mall can ever do that. The second is, uh, you know, the question is that there is very little transparency on how the common area maintenance is being calculated from a mall to a mall? Uh, just like there are good retailers and not so good retailers, there are good malls and not so good malls. Um, I think um, if you, you know, any of the retailers or the developers on this side uh, today, I think you'll find a fair element of transparency. In any case, our uh, CAM is subject to audit. We provide, our books are uh, open to anybody who wants to inspect them. We provide a certificate. So, and it's done by one of the big five auditors in the world. So, you know, the, that question does not arise. If you deal with small one-off guys who don't know this business and try and make money on scam, then I think you've chosen the wrong location rather than worry about uh, honest or dishonest scam. And the third point was uh, really on the turnover 
rent. And he's saying is that uh, the developer has said is that he would want to put in his own cashier uh, or the till man. Uh, this is first for me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't have anybody here. I, I have no idea. I, I've never heard of this before, honestly. Good. Uh, you know, with, with that, uh, we're going to end the panel. Uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate the time uh, that you've taken. You know, clearly there's been a lot of advancement that has happened from two or three years ago, uh, where we were really trying to understand, you know, this, uh, this, this subject, this animal. Uh, from where we are today, there's a lot more collaboration, there's a lot more understanding. Uh, you know, clearly from, from, from the perspective where we have now come in, I think we moved away from the infancy or the nascent uh, stage uh, towards the maturing stage. I clearly think is the, that there is still you know, a way uh, before we can actually say that we are a much more matured uh, you know, dialogue between the, between the community. But I think overall we're going on the, on the right direction. So thank you very much uh, once again, and thank you for the patient listening uh, late evening on a Wednesday. Thank you. <laughs>